The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Here now the word of the Lord as it is found in Psalm 24, beginning at verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, today is the last Lord's Day before the celebration of the Incarnation, the last Sunday of Advent, uh, the last Sunday before Christmas. And it is our last Sunday as we study this uh, remarkable psalm, this psalm of breadth and depth and richness. And so, As we come to this momentous turn in the calendar, let's pray that the Lord would open our hearts and eyes and minds to his word. Father, we thank you for the promise that your word is a word of power. We pray that you would open our eyes, that we might behold it, that you would open our hearts, that we might receive it, Uh, that you would open our hands, uh, that grace may be poured out from on high. Uh, If we ask this all in the great name of the King of glory, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Alexander McLaren has said that Psalm 24 is a catalog of the whole inventory of redemption. Likewise, great Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs said uh, that herein is the whole record of the wide sweep of redemption, from creation and fall to redemption and glory. Indeed, here in Psalm 24, it seems that we've got all of the story of redemption. Uh, We have uh, God's sovereignty and his Uh, creative prowess in verses 1 and 2. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. But then in verses 3 and 4, we get some bad news. The question is asked, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? The answer that is given is very disconcerting. Only those who have clean hands, pure hearts, who have not lifted up their souls to an idol or sworn by what is false. (laughs) Who among us? could ever, therefore, ascend the hill of the Lord? Who among us could ever stand in his holy place? That's the bad news. But then Psalm 24 uh, turns a corner and declares good news. There is redemption yet for those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. In fact, the, the Lord himself will pour out his blessing on them though unbidden, and he will pour out his righteousness on them, though unmerited. Verses 5 and 6. That's the good news. And then here, the psalm ends with this exultant praise that as the glory of the king is revealed. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. 
from eternity past to infinite future. Psalm 24 surveys the whole of God's everlasting eternal decrees. Thus, it has always been Psalm 24 that the church turns to, but during both Christmas and Easter, it celebrates his advent and his ascension. It lauds his unbending standards of righteousness and his unwarranted grace. It declares his resurrection victory and his eternal session at the right hand of the Father. Now, Abraham Kuyper uh, said uh, that a fine theologian could spend his entire career and never get past Psalm 24. <laughs> Herman Bavink that his, uh, his younger yoke fellow at the Free University of Amsterdam said, Psalm 24 is a summary of the entire biblical worldview in a single psalm. It's a veritable concordance of theology and doctrine, of systematics and dogmatics. It is so hermeneutically rich and we could get lost in its details, and we're apt to forget what it actually is. Because you see, Psalm 24 is first and foremost a song. That it is first and foremost a hymn of praise. It exalts in rapturous worship. We moderns tend to be very reductionistic and rationalistic. And so when we come to a passage that's rich like this, we want to ferret out all of the theological details. Forgetting that it was actually this burst of worship and praise that caused David to pin these words. Now, of course... But that shouldn't really surprise us. All of the richest, all of the best, all of the deepest, all of the most profound moments in redemption history are always celebrated in song, aren't they? But, I mean, in, in the same way that Christmas is inseparable from Christmas music, the story of redemption is inseparable from the songs of praise of God's people. Uh, we see it at every turn in the scriptures. Uh, when Deborah and Barak uh, overcame Sisera and his minions, uh, the first thing that they do in Judges chapter 5 is burst forth into song. Uh, when David came back from slaying Goliath, all of the people of Israel lined the roads. They began to dance and sing with praise in 1 Samuel chapter 18. At the temple's completion in 2 Chronicles chapter 5, Solomon, uh, the Levites, and all of the people began to burst forth into song. We have Jehoshaphat's battle song in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, Isaiah's vineyard song in Isaiah chapter 5. Uh, We have Jeremiah's five lamentations. There's Ezekiel's lament in Ezekiel 19, Amos's dirge in Amos 5, Habakkuk's song of redemption in Habakkuk chapter 3, and then in Luke chapter 1, Mary's Magnificat. And then immediately following that, in Luke chapter 2, the over Bethlehem in the skies above come the angelic hosts, and what do they do? They sing. J.I. Packer always used to say that a theology that cannot be sung is not a good theology. It's really interesting. Uh, One of the foundational songs of the Old Testament, in fact, woven all the way into the New Testament, there is a song that is referenced in all of those other songs. And a half a dozen more. It is Moses' song. 
We run across it for the first time in Exodus chapter 15. It's immediately after the parting of the Red Sea that Moses stands before the hosts of Israel and he begins to sing. Now, I will sing unto the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider are thrown into the sea for the Lord, he is a warrior. Almighty God is he. At the end of his life, he picks up the refrain again. Moses' song continues in Deuteronomy 32. The mighty Lord of hosts, he is our rock. His work is perfect. His ways are justice, righteousness. The just and upright is he. And then all the way at the end of the Bible, in Revelation chapter 15, We have this remarkable scene where Moses steps out from amidst the throng, arrayed around the throne in the glassy sea. And once again, he leads the refrain in what Revelation chapter 15, verse 3 calls Moses' great song. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, oh King of the ages, who will not fear you? Who will not worship and bow down before you? For your righteous decrees have been made known. And all nations will come and they will worship before you. Interestingly, that, uh, that song of Moses is referenced or quoted in Psalm 50, Psalm 78, 105, 106, Isaiah chapter 1, Ezekiel 26, 29, 23, Habakkuk chapter 3, and here in Psalm 24. All of the great themes of Moses' song are, are seen right here in these last four verses. Uh, this uh, final antiphon, this Call and response refrain uh, picks up from Moses' song, uh, heads lifted up, the procession of majesty, the might and the strength and the glory of the Most High, his victory as the warrior Lord and the entrance of the hosts for the enthronement celebration. It's all right here in this great song. I want you to notice a couple of things. Uh, First of all, did you notice this uh, unique phrase, the king of glory? It's used five times in these four short verses and nowhere else in the Bible. Uh, The Lord is called the God of glory in Psalm 29 and Acts 7. He's called the Lord of glory in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and in James chapter 2, but nowhere else is he called the king of glory. Now, most commentators believe that it's intended to be a kind of universal honorific, uh, pointing to the, to the whole panoply of the attributes and the character of God. Uh, reminding us uh, both of his majesty and of his mystery. In a sense, uh, this is the psalmist's poetic way of saying he is the king above all kings. He is the Lord above all lords. He is Elohim. He's the king of glory. A second thing that I want you to notice is uh, verses 7 and 9 are almost identical, as are verses 8 and 10. Almost identical, with an emphasis on almost. (laughs) Not not quite. Uh, Notice, but the refrain uh, moves from the passive, be lifted up, O you ancient doors, verse 7, and moves to the active, Lift them up, O you ancient doors. Verse 9. And then in verse 8, the king of glory is the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. 
with a singular focus on the Lord himself. But then in verse 10, the king of glory is the Lord of hosts. Now the Lord is not alone. He's gathered an army around himself. He's gathered for himself a people. Now these distinctions are not mere poetic variations. The movement from the passive to the active, the the movement from the singular to the plural, actually follows the pattern of salvation, doesn't it? But we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And it's God who acts. You can't be more passive than dead in your trespasses and sins. Dead men don't dance. Dead men don't choose. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. But the Lord of glory comes and he pours forth his grace so that our heads are lifted up and the gates of our hearts are opened up. That's the way of redemption. That's the story of the gospel. And notice, too, that God does this individually. He comes to us one by one. He knows every single heart. He knows every single soul. He knows every single sin. He knows that we don't have clean hands. He knows that we don't have pure hearts. He knows that we've lifted up our souls to idols. He knows that we are covenant breakers. But he pours out his grace upon us singularly, but then adds us to a glorious number, plural. We become a part of the host of the Lord. See this? It's a beautiful picture of the gospel. This is why heads are lifted up. This is why the gates and the doors are opened up. These are familiar Old Testament phrases to describe the transformation that occurs when God's grace falls upon us. In a sense... Uh, What this picture shows us is that as the king of glory ascends to his proper place, having descended as a babe in a manger, now he gathers in his train a whole host. And as he comes into his inheritance, the whole city, all of the people, the rocks and stones themselves cry out, All heaven and nature now sing. They sing the song of triumph. This is the image that we see in Psalm 3 and Psalm 27 and Isaiah 60. There's the beautiful picture of the redemption of the Lord. This This is why hymn writers from Handel in his Messiah Uh, to uh, Schutz and Weissel, along with Walter Scott, use Psalm 24 to celebrate the wonder of Advent and Christmas. Because after all, this message is so incredibly counterintuitive. It upends the whole wisdom of the world. It's a disruptive message. It's a message of a people in need who have nothing to commend them to the Lord. And yet the Lord God on high descends to the depths and he redeems those wicked and perverse people, cleansing them with his own righteousness and then ascending back to his proper place. The picture is a picture of disruption and a subversion of of the way of the world. Uh, He descends before he ascends. He comes as a suffering servant before he comes as a victorious conqueror. He comes seeking and saving the lost long before he sends out 
his ambassadors to the uttermost parts of the earth. The king of glory comes first as a babe in the manger. This disruptive message is the message of Christmas. It is the message of the gospel. I don't know about you, but I love Christmas and everything about Christmas, from the cookies and the fruit cakes uh, to the wassail and the hot chocolate. I, I love the little family traditions. But I, although about a day or a day and a half after Christmas has come and gone, I'm ready for the decorations to go away. I love the decorations when they first come out. It's incredible. The incredible joy that it fills us with. But what is even more incredible is how disruptive, how subversive the message of Christmas is to the whole world. It's during this week that no one can escape the fact that Jesus Christ was born in a manger. No one can escape the reality that Bethlehem changed the world. Every time we stand at a cash register and say, Merry Christmas, and we see that befuddled look like, okay, do I answer the the, the way I want to answer or do I be politically correct or is my manager looking right now? (laughs) This is the disruption of the gospel. Charles Haddon Spurgeon put it this way. He said, an infinite and an infant. Eternal yet born of a woman. Almighty yet hanging on a woman's breast. Supporting a universe and yet needing to be carried in a mother's arms. The king of angels yet uh, the reputed son of Joseph. The heir of all things and yet the carpenter's despised son. Oh, the wonder of Christmas. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Martin Luther put it this way, the true Christian religion is incarnational and thus does not begin at the top like all other religions do. It begins at the bottom. You must run directly to the manger and to the mother's womb Embrace the infant and the virgin's child in your arms and look at him, born, being nursed, growing up, going about in human society, walking the dusty roads of Galilee, teaching, dying, rising again, ascending above the heavens and having authority over all things. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors that the king of glory may come in. But Psalm 24 uh, declares to us uh, what we love to sing. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. The earth is the Lord's. And everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or uh, swear by what is false. (laughs) So, he comes with blessing. His blessing. He comes with righteousness, his righteousness. For he is the God of our salvation. So lift up your heads, O ye gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. He is the king of glory. And because he is, we can say, Merry Christmas. 
This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.